Hey, I'm Jerry Levinson, and this is the Flooring Business Podcast, where each week we talk to expert flooring dealers, suppliers, marketing experts, software experts, and anyone I believe who's going to help you in your flooring business. Now, my mission is to give you good information that'll help you reach your goals. If you're just starting your business or trying to reach $5 million in sales, or you're ready to sell your business, you're going to find useful information that's going to help you reach your goals and profit now in the flooring industry. Now, remember, each Thursday, I'm offering sales training. It's going to be good for your entire team. It's only $150 per month, and it's going to more than pay for itself over and over again as I show you ways to close more sales at higher prices. Now, in this week's episode, I've got a good treat for you. A um, friend of mine, Dean Paulson, who we've been talking for years now, uh, he owns a Florida Trader outlet in Tacoma, Washington. And uh, one of the things we talk about often is he specializes in carrying inventory. And what is it like to be an inventory dealer? What is it like to have that stock? What's that commitment look like? What are the benefits and what are some of the, the uh, uh, cautionary tales or warnings that you should have? Uh, what are some of the concerns you should have? Uh, right now, it seems very relevant to consider carrying an inventory with all the rising shipping costs and uh, inventory is going up, prices are going up in materials. So providing a good customer experience uh, is a lot easier when you can sell them stuff that you already have, you stock, you don't have to worry about it being put on back order for you know weeks or months on end and disappointing your customer. So with that said, Dean, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and the floor trader? Well, thanks, Jerry. Um, I run a 101-year-old family business. Um, I'm the third generation, and, and thank God I got my son, who's the fourth generation, in with me. His name's Zach. He's 27. And right now, we run a, a, small, a small single store um, that's about, in square footage-wise, showroom's about 11,000 square feet. The building's about 18, so... That leaves room for a warehouse and offices on the backside. So um, we do pretty good numbers, actually really good. And being that we stock a ton of material, uh, not only in the store, but in four containers, because we do buy big, um, gives us a lot of opportunity to, to salvage our margins and not uh, be dictated to by how much margin we make. So that's really an advantage to us. It's funny, I got a whole list of questions for you, and I'm sure as you talk, I'm going to come up with more questions because just as you're talking now, it just it, there's so many questions that it begs that um, when did you start to decide to uh, carry inventory? Have you always had an, an inventory? Actually not. Back in, we were um, part of Carpet One, CCA Global. We were the 21st member back in 1985 when they all started. So we had to went through the Carpet One store, fran, you know, the franchise. Yeah. And we also had a pro source, which of course didn't stock either. And it, Carpet One's our uh, material only cut order. Um, back in about 1995 is when we started our first outlet store. And we sort of dabbled in carrying stock and, and, and that sort of thing. And then we went through a total revamp of our, of our location in about 97 and converted it all into a stocking store. It actually started out with the uh, CCA's first try at uh, Stone Mountain. And then we took it off from there. And then as we built uh, three larger locations other than the one we had, we went through a name change and then 2008 came along and sort of wiped a lot of that out. Um, thank God we had inventory because that allowed us to sell off our inventory, maintain capital, because the banks cut off your credit line. Right. And, um, I remember that. Yeah, we survived all that because we had inventory and and then whittled down our stores down to one store. And then we just started going from okay. there. Okay. Well, let's not pass over that because uh, 2008 and nine were big. It crushed me. Um, and I didn't have any inventory, but it, yeah, you're right. The banks cut out your credit lines instantly. Um, yeah. That was a phone. That was a phone call. It's like, well, by the way, we're shutting down your credit line. So you owe us $300,000. Wow. Like, Damn. Yeah, it was. Um, so you did have inventory, though. You had stock. We did. We had uh, not only our store in Tacoma, we had one in Auburn, one in Lacey. Um, about the same size, if not a little bit bigger. 
And thank God we had, you know, probably $1.7 million worth of inventory to liquidate to help carry us through that whole transition period. Okay. And that's a lot. That's a lot of inventory. So how do you get started with it? I mean, there's a lot of new dealers out there that, you know, there's a lot of lot that goes into getting inventory. So where do you begin? You know, if somebody's wanting to start carrying inventory, they're not going to go out and spend a million dollars on, on inventory. No, that's a, that's a really important point. Um, you just have to um, live thin and invest all your money back in the one special buys are the way to go. Everybody's trying to turn their inventory, turn their old inventory. As we all know, we live in a very fashionable industry as it is. So what was hopping last year may not be the as big of a mover this year. So um, we have built up years and years and years worth of relationships with distributor, local distributors and special, um, I'd say jobbers that, that, that buy huge inventory lots left over from the big guys. Uh, we used to buy containers of drop material from like even Lowe's. Um, we found that through a third party, we could buy stuff that they used to sell at Lowe's and say, see Lowe's and Home Depot and the big box stores used to have to have backup inventory um, guaranteed sitting at the distributor at the manufacturer for when they need it. So it's on call. Well, they didn't care at all if they would strike a pen and say, yeah, we don't need it anymore. We're going to change styles. And so the mills would have to liquidate that. And I would be luckily one of the first calls they make. And I'd buy a container and save 50% off, if not back Does in that, the day. You know, oh, back in the day. I was going to say, does that still day. exist today? You know, you know, to some point it still exists. It's all based upon relationship and how much you can buy at a time. Whether it's even six pallets, 10 pallets or eight pallets, you can play the game and you can pick it up for 20% off and then turn around and make 45, 50 points, if not more. So uh, the interesting lesson in this, and I found that too, when I got started in this industry, didn't know anything. Um, I also wasn't afraid to ask. Uh, so talking to the, the suppliers, uh, I would do things like ask for more co-op money or uh, when I was having financial trouble, ask them to, uh, create a note for me. And I, I find a lot of people are afraid to ask the supplier for things, you know, so asking them if there's any special buys or inventory, the special goods I didn't know about for a long time. And, right. and then had to ask about that, found out about that. It's like, oh, wow. Why didn't they don't just tell you everything you got to you hit, that's where the relationship comes in. You, you, you pick up special goods, dropped inventory, canceled inventory. Um, now that the mills are starting to go like builder direct type of type of things, there's, there's lots of times where they'll have canceled containers or canceled material or huge, huge allotments of like a canceled product because maybe the project didn't have enough funding for a multi-tenant or multi-family huge project that they're stuck with the material. Yeah. So you can always pick that up at a re de decent price, but you have to have the money to, to pitch up and play too. So how are you doing now? You're, uh, um, I'm just going to say it. You're a little combative when it comes to suppliers these days. <laughs> what do you how mean? Are, uh, uh, on some of the comments, uh, you know, when it comes oh, to the displays, it especially like paying for displays and things like that. Well, what yeah. is your relationship like with suppliers these days? Like, like some of the big boys and things like that. I think I have a really good relationship with the suppliers. Um, it, it's a love hate relationship. They love to hate me sometimes and I love to hate them. Um, <laughs> I, I figure, um, you know, it depends upon your relationship about your, uh, I'm old school when it comes to doing stuff. If I say I'm gonna do something, I turn around, I do it. Whether it's, you know, good, bad or indifferent, I, I turn around and I step up. That, that's a big thing. Um, if you say you're going to move this product and they give you a special buy to move the product or whatever, you do it, you focus on it, you advertise it, and you move it. And then the more you do that, the more you prove to them you can help them and through they turn around can help you. So if, if that answers your question. Well, no, I agree 100%. Um, I mean, uh, you manage that relationship. That's great. I, just, I always nurtured my relationships. So. There's, there's a ton of, of, of fly-by-night guys that, that fly through your door, have this one special, and then you never see from them again. I don't deal with those guys. I'm, I'm a long-term um, buyer relationship. I'm, I'm old school developing the relationships with the suppliers, 
preferably not the rep, but the, the two or three people above them, usually RVPs. Um, My problem so is the supply, well, and it's not a problem with the suppliers, uh, but when you go to a show or something, the suppliers always have an agenda. The big bosses tell them, move this product, move this stuff. We want, we want right. to promote this, we want to move this. And the problem is really lies in with the flooring dealers. They don't have the agenda. Like when I come in, I have an agenda. I have my goals set. I know what I want to do. You know, I know what I'm looking for. So our conversations are very different. I don't care what their agenda is. I know what my agenda is. Right. I really don't care about their, I really don't go down to Vegas anymore um, for services with an agenda. Uh, the only agenda I have is to, to meet and establish and nurture the relationships I have with the vice presidents, the presidents, and the regional directors, because that's where the pricing comes from. The pricing doesn't come from your rep mm. or, or even his boss, because reps always get squeezed. They have no authority like they used to to do anything. Um, and they're just the go-between. You know, you present the offer, then they'll go to their boss. And by the time you're done dicking around with that, the material's gone to somebody else. Yeah. So um, when I go down there, I, I look for interesting, unique stuff. And I don't, I offer, I place offers on stuff. Like uh, one time with one of the suppliers, they wanted, um, they were closing out some LVP, which is really good high-end stuff. And um, they wanted like what they thought was a great buy $1.79. And, and that was a, a more than fair deal, but they wanted to move it. And it was in my backyard. And I said, look at, I'll take it all for 99 cents. Just throw it in out there. They said, okay. So I took 15 pallets of, Stuff for 99 cents, turn around and sold it for $2.99 at the time. Nice. That's how you make the deals. That's how you make your margin. Yeah, that was actually one of my questions too. Are you more profitable selling the inventory uh, or are the margins tighter? I, I know a lot of people buy inventory to help save their customers money. And it's like, isn't that your opportunity to make more money? Yes, absolutely. You don't want to pass the, the, the saving jar onto your customer. You make your money what you what you buy it for, not what you sell it for. Um, what I do is, when it comes to, well, it depends on your competition too. Um, we just had a, a floor and decor move like half a block down the street. Now everybody's all worried about floor and decor. It's like having a new Home Depot open up next to you. I think it's the best thing in the world. One, it drives traffic, and it, it puts more people across your your driveway. And um, excuse me, my phone's clicking no battery um it it gives you more opportunity to sell the product um i forgot my train of thought i'm sorry uh, what was the question again uh, we were talking about the well you were talking about the competition and um uh selling though you were talking about buying product. product for the customer yeah advantage um i think if you have a good quality product you can steer the customer to what you want to sell and what still fits their needs rather than putting out a thousand samples like everyone wants to put in your showroom with all these displays and racks and everything else uh people come in they're very conscious about money right now and when you're buying pallets you're definitely savings oh 15 20 percent probably over a cut order price um so you can still make a higher margin than you would cut order like cut order most most stores 30 to 40 percent they try to get 40 and they'll probably meet in the middle of 35 whereas I sell 45 to 50%. So when you are figuring your, your product and your pricing, do you have any consideration for breakage? Like you're going to have some left over that you're not going to sell, especially on closeouts and things like that. Yeah. When you get down to your last 10 boxes, you, you group it all together, you sell it for what you paid for it. And you, you just lot sell it off. It doesn't really, you put it to house. It doesn't really go to a sales guy. Um, so you're not losing money on it. You just lot sell it out and say, here, here it is, bare bones, get it out the door. Okay. So you're really, you're really not, the only time you have breakage is damage cartons from forklift damage or something like that. Well, how much are you donating or throwing away? Uh, donating, we don't really donate too much. And we don't really, we throw away ones or two boxes of a lot or something like that. It really is negligible but when you're dealing with 45 percent, 50 percent margins it doesn't impact you as if you were trying to throw it all out the door at 25 okay well that was a key point though is that you are 
buying and getting better buys to make more money, not to right. help save customers money. And well, you help save customers money as well because I can buy. Let's see. Um, you sell product for what's valued at it in the in the competitive arena. So if you're buying it for twenty percent less, you can make forty percent on it. Whereas comparison, if someone bought that same thing on a cut order basis from the store down the street, you're already beating them by 20%. I mean, you're making more margin right, right there anyway. Um, when you can buy 10, eight to 10 pallets at a time in the, in the same lots, you have it on site. If, if it fits the color, which is what the customer's number one thing is, and you, and you have it in stock, especially in today's market, you're going to win. I mean stocking stores win right now because it's really hard to get it. And get I, when I started, I said, I'll never carry inventory unless I have a system for selling it. And then we came up with the home seller dream program and we started the inventory some carpet. And now my son does have quite a bit of inventory in carpet, not hard surface. Um, anytime he's grabbed hard surfaces and in inventory, we haven't been able to move it. Uh, so with that said though, you know, where do people get started? And again, I started learning that, hey, I can buy five rolls and then get six months to pay for it or 10 rolls and get, you know, three to six months to pay for it. Um, That's Financing is a whole nother game. You don't want to, you don't want to take that typical shot as, hey, you don't pay for it for six months. I never do that. That's the no. worst case, worst, okay. worst thing you could do. How do I'll you do that? that? I'll explain that in a sec. Um, you find the smaller mills, um, the special goods departments and the big box and, and that like the Shaw's and the Mohawks, you work with them, you build up a relationship for that person that services your, your part of the country, um, that sort of thing. You find the, the, the people with money like Michael's carpet that'll go in and buy a whole, whole lot of odd lot carpet for cheap and then turn around and resell it to you. They make little, you still save. 20, 25%. That's the stuff that you, you pick up. And then you turn around and sell it what it's worth in the marketplace. You don't put a straight flat margin on it. You just sell it for what it's worth and you'll end up making 40 to 50%. So, so these people shouldn't be going to their supplier necessarily, or the big, the big suppliers, the Mohawks, the Shaws, the Dreamweavers and, and whatnot. They can look at other even what? competitors. Re here, here's what about Dreamweaver. Dreamweavers, I'm glad you brought them up. They come out with roll specials that's only available in the roll. Okay. That'll save you a ton of money because they'll be 30% less in roll specials when they do yarn use ups or they have a special buy of yarn. They make 100 rolls of it and that's all they have. And then that's where you make your money rolls only products. And they have a whole division for that. Um, and there's other suppliers out there that you can, you can hit up that do that, that contract out with the big mills to make carpet for them. They spec this ounce, they spec the weight, spec the color that they want, and they're below the market typically. And they just move a lot of them. Okay, so I want you to give advice to, to the flooring dealer, and we got a ton of them who are just starting their business out and the Mohawk, Shaw, Dreamweaver, all the, all the big boys, they won't give them the time of day. No. How do you recommend those people get started? That's a very good question. Um, one, have good capital backing behind you. Um, and boy, if I was to start all over now. I mean, can they talk to some of the bigger competitors and grab some inventory, get an old display? Is there, you know, again, you've already introduce some channels I've never even heard of, like going to Home Depot or, or Lowe's or, or getting inventory from the Shaw's and, and places like that. So, and, which is a relationship you gotta, you gotta, you gotta know go who, imagine if you got the money, you can pay for it. Right, you gotta know who buys their inventory in huge or lots and then go to them. Um, and that just takes a matter of time and experience. And, and most guys are pretty tight lipped about their sources. Uh, because I was just, they, they feed us, they, you know. Yeah, um, it's, I was it's, just talking Dean, to a, a tile installer and in, in who doesn't have much work right now, and and uh, I said, why don't you go to the stores that are around there? There's a lot of people that sell tile that don't install it, 
Right. And he's like, wow, I never even thought of that. And <laughs> so, so, you know, wow. he hit the phones and, and start contacting these, you know, he's advertising, he's trying to find customers. And I'm like, there's a lot of stores that, you know, you don't have to be a wholesaler. You can go there and they can just recommend you. Right. Because you know, they don't want anything to do with a tile install. So yeah, we've, we've done it all both ways. We, we, matter of fact, four traders whole system is, is here's a list of installers call one. They'll take good care of you. And we keep those guys busy. We don't make a dime on later, but labor, but we don't also don't have the liability of the labor or install as well. So when the customer calls back and says, Hey, the seams looking terrible. I can just truly say, Hey, call your certified installer. Who's a professional. He can take good care of you. So because that was actually a question I had for you too, is do you guys provide installation or are you just doing material only? Um, the, the way the floor trainer system works, we do just material only. We refer installation on a list. You can't not, you can't just refer a person's card. So I hear a call bill because the way the laws work, you're, you're referring a professional and you're a professional and they'll tie you into the claim. So you have to you have to put them on a whole list of installers and say, here's a list of installers that we recommend. I'm not choosing one for you. Go ahead and pick one and and they'll do you they'll do you right because they're on our list and they're pre-qualified. If I did something like that, I would have my install direct system and show customers how we save them money by, you know, they get to hire the installers direct. And, and we exactly. the materials. <laughs> so. And part of the negotiation with the installer is that they're going to be under the market rate per se of like what a chain store does. Like let's pick on like uh, Abbey Carpet. Say there's an Abbey Carpet down the street, and Abbey Carpet makes so much on their labor because they're using a, a, the same installer subcontract. They mark it up, you know, 25, 30 percent, and then they resell it. Um, Absolutely. Here, they're here the installer instead of making his normal rate can make 10 percent more for all the hassle of going out measuring up the job. We don't even have to measure on jobs. And we send out the installer, they measure up the job, tell us how much we need, talk about the layout with the customer, schedule with the customer, all the headaches that go along with it. Yeah. And then the, the customers end, ends up paying less and getting, and the installer makes more money. So it's a win-win. So another thing that you've developed in this, uh, I believe is you carry a lot of materials that installers need buy and, and use we so try to. don't you you tried we try to um we carry the basics because we want to be the place the installer goes to on the weekend when they need supplies okay if you're having a installer that actually runs his business like a business and carry has his own remote warehouse little warehouse whatever his garage or whatever where he keeps the extra glues and stuff which is really sort of rare. We have all that sort of stuff in stock. You don't have to stock a lot, but you have to stock general amount, like seam, yeah. you know, a couple boxes of seam tape, pressure sensitive adhesive for the, you know, the um, anything that gets glued down nowadays, whether it's glass back vinyl or even a LVP or something like that. Like I said, this yeah. is an easy interview. I've got all these questions. I haven't really looked at my notes. Keep so. going. <laughs> I could go on for hours. I mean, there's oh. so much information. Oh, let's talk um, about financing real quick. When that, we, I want to hit that point before we forget. Okay. When, when shop comes to you and they go, oh, man, you can buy all this material and you'll give you a six-month financing. And, and people go, oh, that's a great deal. And then they, they, they get all this material in on the finance. They don't pay their bills. They go month after month after month. And then six months rolls around. And then they say, okay, you owe us $150,000. Right. And the guy thought that was all part of profit and he's been spending it and doesn't have it. That's, that's the killer. So, so, and I did mitigate that myself by asking them for whenever you do those terms to charge me an equal amount per month. That's what I do. Like I, I like to do 30, 60, 90, you know, yeah. if I, if I negotiate it down where there's no like 2%, 30, that type of thing, typically it's just bill me in three equal payments, 30, 60, 90, we'll call it good. Right. So at least it's not all doing 30 or 60, but if you can stretch it out to 90 or 120, even better. And, and the but goal is to sell it before the bill comes due, but you're right. You don't have the money exactly. <laughs> when, it, when the bill comes due, <laughs> so, exactly. especially if it's a, a large amount. So um, do you guys, do you carry, do you have any displays still? And do you still sell anything uh, that's custom made? custom ordered 
Absolutely. Absolutely. You have to have that. Okay. Um, I, I go by the old 80 20 rule. I'd say, yeah. excuse me, I'm about to kill my dog. 80 percent of my showroom floor is stock and 20% is special order. Excuse me, just for a sec. I'm gonna do some talker to the fucker. No, don't, don't, don't start now. <laughs> So okay. um, we we're talking about the, the displays. You still have displays. You still yeah. carry them. Do Absolutely. You know, uh, percentage wise, the difference. What do you do percentage wise inventory versus uh, custom order? Do you know? Um, as I said, I separate my showroom. Basically, the 80 percent of the showroom is dedicated to inventory. 20 percent of the showroom space is dedicated to special order samples. Um, you got to have special order samples for a couple of reasons. One, whatever, however your big your, your showroom is, you don't have every color or every style or everything that you can jam into a rack or stand up rack that you can show different lines, right. typically higher end lines too. So people can see what a great value your stock is. So if they go see your stock and right now LVP with click together LVP is like 299 to 399. Well, you can take them over to a rack and say, well, you can upgrade to this because it's thicker and it has all these bells and whistles. And this one happens to be $4.99 or $5.99. It gives you an opportunity to make an upsell product that you don't normally have in stock uh, because it would be too expensive and probably not the right color um, to sell. How often does a rack, I always talk about, you know, you can have a rack where you don't sell anything on that rack. Is it mm -hmm. a waste? Not necessarily because you could sell off of it. There's, if you have an expensive line of products, you can sell your cheaper products for more money. So how often do people go from the rack price and say, you know what, let's, let's go ahead and that inventory, that's good enough. You know, let's get that. And they, they're saving money and you're right. probably in a better margin anyway. Yes, you are. Um, you still sell off the special order. I mean, it, it still sells probably. 18% of our store, and that's where I got the 80-20 rule. 18% uh, of our orders are special order racks. And then we stock a lot. We stock about 65 different rolls of colors of carpet. Now, understand that our warehouse fills more than that because several rolls yet in that one color, you have to have two or three backup rolls because it might be a great moving product. So, I mean, 65 rolls on the floor and probably about 42 uh, pallets of individual colors of LVP or and probably another 20 pallets of laminate. Wow. So big player. I mean, a lot of choices in stock, but there's a lot of opportunity to make margin on cut order. It's just not that, not as profitable. Now, can people buy, let's call it wholesale, quote unquote, wholesale from me? Like, do you have any accounts like business accounts, uh, installers yeah, or anybody? Yeah, what I did is I, I sort of separated my store. I have a I have a different division, um, and we sell wholesale, resale, um, direct. Um, so not only do we have wholesale buys, I might have some buys um, that I'm even liquidating for another supplier. For example, this great deal, uh, liquidating the half inch, uh, first run, first quality product, half inch, seven inches wide by five feet long, nice hardwood. Um, where I'm, I'm actually brokering it from him and I don't have to even take stock delivery for about 79 cents. So I can turn around and sell it all day long for $1.99 wholesale. Oh. I just need to advertise it, run it, get the phone calls coming into that department and sell it via picture and phone call. Wow. It's, it's pretty much a no brainer. I was saying, um, talking to Todd the other day when we were talking about it, just, it, this industry has so many opportunities. It, it's just, it's endless. It does, but you have to, you have to have the connections. So that's why it's really hard when you're first starting out to get those connections, who to talk to. And yeah, you know, you know. there's a lot to learn. I mean, you don't just do it all too. I, I, there's a difference between retail sales and in commercial sales, it's it's a it's like a whole different business. But right, you know, developing some of these, you already got the warehouse, you already got the materials, uh, you could do the wholesale too. In mm -hmm. especially when you're buying at a at a, a much cheaper price, if something's not moving, you can put it on special, put it, you know, get aggressive, put it on your Facebook store or something like that, and start pick up the phone, making calls to builders, flippers, um, 
real estate agents, anybody that that's doing a little side work, small builders and say, Hey, I got, I got five pallets of this great looking product. I can wholesale to you for this. Are you interested? All it takes is a phone call. All they're going to say is no. And Hey, if, if it's no, would you like me to let you know oh, about you got, phones, you got phones that work if you make outgoing calls too? Yeah. Right. No one, <laughs> yeah, that's how it's supposed to work. <laughs> right. you know, typically the salespeople just like well, all the salespeople out there. The phones work both ways. Yeah. You, you can make outgoing calls too. <laughs> so, um, dial for dollars. <laughs> right. So in, in some people confuse all my lecturing about getting, getting good margins, getting prices and all that. There is a difference between having inventory and having products and doing volume. And then when you attach labor, if you're doing labor, you can't do volume because there's a time factor you that's can't. involved. You only have so much labor, so much time. Uh, hours in a day with your labor you want to make as much in the labor as you possibly can absolutely yeah you know? and you can't outprice yourself in the marketplace but you can't be too cheap either i never want to be the low guy and i never want to be the high guy i just want to be the sort of like upper medium guy okay so for sampling though how do you handle your sampling oh that's awesome i have a great idea for that uh hard surface carpet and I wish I would know these questions beforehand. I could give you pictures so you could. <laughs> well, and That's when I post it, maybe you could send over some pictures and I could post the pictures with the. I don't uh, know. That's giving away trade secrets here. So <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm in awe of you because I, I would like to do the same thing that you do before socking floor cabinet store and, and teach people how to do all this sort of stuff that I do very successfully. Yeah. Um, well, you know, what we need to do is uh, maybe put out something and invite them to your showroom. Yeah. I mean, where we can we'll figure it out. Yeah. But um, the, back in the day, the, the way to sample carpet, let's take carpet, for example, you, you flap the carpet over, you cut off six inches, you flap it back and then you shove this little six inch piece all the way down the roll. And then a little, a little piece sticks out of the roll and then you wrap it up three different spots with cling wrap. Well, we don't do that anymore. We found that one, people always go to the bottom roll they take that little sample and they pull it all the way out. And then they go, oh, and they drag that whole foot strip, 12 foot strip all over the store. And they go, can I have a piece of this? And then you're left to having your warlocks guy unbury the entire stack and put it back where it goes. Hmm. So what we do is we just, we put everything in, in bins. We take that strip, we cut it up into six inch pieces, throw it in a bin, put a label on it, that that goes to that carpet. And so when they want a sample, they go to that bin, pull it out and give them a cut sample. There you go. Okay. Yeah, and it's nice that they can take the sample with them. Yeah, absolutely. And um, if anyone notches carpets, I will kill them. If anybody what? <laughs> notches carpets. Yeah. Typically, uh, some some stores allow their warehouse guy or their sales guy to notch. Oh, I'll just cut a little six inch swatch off the corner of the carpet. Well, and then they start going down the the side of the roll, which every time you cut pieces off, you, you're losing material. And that's, that's a kiss of death right there. And that look, makes your showroom look terrible. Yeah. So there, there are tricks when you stock carpet and stock uh, boxes of laminate and LVP. Mm -hmm. that, Do you have that, a warehouse guy? I mean, they got to stay on top of everything. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. We have three warehouse guys that wow. are in charge of keeping the warehouse straight, as well as salespeople. But it's hard enough to get the salespeople to dust, much less keep it straight. But they, they do. They have pride in their store. I always experiment, you know, leave whatever something's on the ground. I leave it there just to see how long it takes. And I just, just did that the other day. I left, left the sample boards on the table and see how long it takes to get them put away. Yeah. Yeah. And oftentimes it doesn't. Uh, so that doesn't happen. Uh, there's a gentleman, Tim, uh, asked, what suppliers offer the most protection since more and more seem to want to sell directly to consumers or prioritize big box stores? Um, so maybe talk a little bit about direct selling. Do you find, and again, I don't think you would, but do you find any competition with people selling, uh, any suppliers selling direct Absolutely. My number one, and, and you mentioned it, I am ruthless when it comes to Mohawk. Mohawk, Shaw, Shaw started up, started buying up retail stores and started to try to go vertical from 
manufacturing to, to selling the end product and they failed at that miserably. Now Mohawk has come out with their outlet stores, a couple, and then they take all their special goods, shove it over to their outlet store online, and then try to sell it direct to the consumer, bypass you, and, and they advertise Mohawk and all this other stuff. This is why I'm a big fan of private labeling. You won't see a Mohawk label in my store if I ever buy from Mohawk or Shaw or any other big box store. We private label everything. So people, one, can't shop it, two, you make more money on it. Um, when it comes to, to uh, more suppliers going direct, boy, that's, that's where the, uh, if you're not part of a, like a program like CCA or, or Abbey or some other buying group that, that'll create that private label thing, create the relationship to keep it going, you're gonna get sort of stuck. Um, so I always private label just for marketing reasons. If they didn't yeah. have my private label, but um, I didn't think that prevented anybody from shopping me if they. Oh, were... they'll always shop you. There's always something that'll take 10, you know, 10 cents over cost. Yeah, I mean, it's the little guy that works out of his little 10 by 10 office in, in Texas. Yeah. They'll take a wholesale order on anything for 10%. The thing I found most difficult was uh, when. Lowe's was selling, uh, like I had a, a tough tech or no, it was caress. I had a caress product that they were selling installed cheaper than what I could buy it for. Yeah. That's sort of annoying, isn't it? Um, no, it, was, and I, I understand product. that bigger buys, they should get better buys, but it shouldn't be so low that the retail price is below my wholesale price. Yeah, here's what happens. The big box stores will go to the manufacturers and they'll say, give me your best selling color. Okay, so that they go, here, here it is. It's a 55 ounce best selling color is Dune. Okay, and they'll go, great, take that yarn, make it, dial it down to 45 or 42 ounce, make it feel about the same, and then I'll buy a thousand rolls for all of our stores. Right, which I, I've, I've heard that too. It's like, well, they don't make it the same. It's not as good a quality as what you're giving. It's like, uh, but, if, whether that's true or not, try to explain that to a consumer. Exactly. And it's got the same name and it, and it looks and feels the same. You are not going to convince them that they should pay, you know, twice the money for what should be the same product. Right. There used to be a, a, a study that I referred to that, you know, they take the same carpet, deal it out between 20 of the, these professional store owners and they have to guess, you know, the yarn type and the weight and everything else. It was all over the board. How, if professionals can't do it, how do consumers do it? And so. Right. And I, and I teach it and I don't bitch about box stores often or, or, you know, what I teach because it's just a reality that we got to live with. So you're either going to live with it, deal with it, understand and learn how to market and sell. Right. Close up shop. Right. You know, so we're not clerks. We really have a lot of choices in this. And well, although it, to me, this is the, the thing that you have that many dealers don't is I don't think you're as dependent on the suppliers because you've opened up so many more options to yourself. Right. I'm not that, to the, we used to be the big three, but not the big two. Um, there's a lot of smaller suppliers out there that'll help you with um, product that don't hit the radar of the big box because they don't care about it. They don't, they only want to deal with the big suppliers that can provide that huge amount just to them, you know, whereas there's a lot of good buys from like, say marquee would be one um, Michael's carpets. Um, there's a bunch of smaller mills, smaller, boutique mills that you can actually get a better product than what the the big, big the big boys even have at a better price so so what about a little sensitive uh subject but what about capital i mean it, it requires some capital to build up an inventory it is it, it, does it get easier over time is it is it is <laughs> uh, right it, now it's gotten a lot harder a lot harder um it's harder harder because um one, the lack of materials around. Um, th there's a huge shortage all sitting offshore in boats. Uh, the, the price of gas has gone up. The freight cost has gone extremely high. Um, where you used to be, we could import a container right out of China, which is the best way yeah, 
to play the game uh, used to be like $3,800 a few years ago. And now it's 25,000 to 20,000. It's crazy. It's just um, the, the best way to do it is, is make up good relations with your local suppliers, local distributors, and work with them to help move their closeouts over stocks, over buys, stuff like that. That's where you're going to pick up. Yeah, I think that advice is huge for these guys that are, are getting started, especially that, that uh, again, they're having trouble getting, unless they join a buying group, they just can't get the materials from any suppliers. They won't open up the accounts. And you got to put a risk. You got to sign on the bottom line because everyone wants personal guarantees. You're going to have to pay to play personally. You got to have to put a, your house on the line and your yeah. IP and everything else. Some people don't want to do that. Yeah, well, we all do that in order to engage in the criminal activity of doing retail business. Yes. <laughs> so, I think that's most of my questions. Uh, what other general advice, just as a businessman, would you give to people out there? You've been in this business for a long time and in uh, 101 years, you look fantastic. <laughs> Personally, I've been, I know, I've been doing this. Thir- I looked at the other day, it's like 33 years I've been doing this. And that's just out of college. That's not any, even from the womb to the warehouse, scraping weeds in the sidewalk. Um, buy low, sell high. <laughs> that's, you want to buy the best product you can. And I don't mess with seconds. You will go crazy, stupid, nuts if you try to sell, get into the seconds market. Um, let me tell you an example of a second. I was approached with a, a super buy. The other day it was like a, a 5.5 mil spc but one piece in every box had the pad that overlit the clicking mechanism so your installer one had to see it two had to take his knife cut that half inch off peel it and then click it together mm. okay but if you sell that to a material only customer one you have to explain it to them and the more you explain it to them the more they feel like it's seconds and everything else and then they want to pay like 59 cents for it. And you're trying to sell this for $2 and 49 cents on a super power buy. Yeah. And there's a disproportionate relationship. And then they think everything you sell is seconds. So I try to stay way out of the secondary market. Um, there's no, there's no, nothing good is going to come selling a carpet that has a, a visible line down the middle of it, especially when the customer wants to say, Hey, can I see that roll? And it's on the bottom. You have to pull it out, unroll 20 feet of it, have them look at it, inspect it. And then it gets installed because they've signed off on it and they still hate it. And then there's a big claim because they canceled their visa charge. Right. <laughs> so there's a lot of headaches. Um, so I'd stay away from the secondary market. Um, as far as getting into the game, I'm glad stocking stores are harder to get into because I can tell you what, it's not hard to get in to open up a showroom with samples. Almost, it's like realtors. There's a realtor in every corner. And I'll tell you, it actually is. I mean, I, I talk to flooring dealers all the time and I call them Goik. It's uh, the guys that are, are, have been installing for years mm-hmm. they can't install anymore. They've reached an age and their body just can't handle it. And they're getting into this industry. They love the industry. And, and so they want to get in the retail side, but nobody will give them an account. Here's, here's the best way to do it. Here's my, it just popped in my head. If I was in that same position, I would get a job with a really good, probably either a family owned business that's elderly, that you know, they're going to be wanting to retire in five or 10 years, depending on how old you are, learn the business from the inside out, learn the connections, have them teach you how to buy. You have the reputation of the store and the age of the store. There's so many family owned businesses that are getting up and older in age that the, the, the kids didn't want to go into it. You know, the kids went to college, they, they doing something else, engineering or whatever. Um, and they hated the family business because family business is tough. It, once you, I mean, my kid hates me sometimes, but he's my, one of my big, one, I'm one of his biggest fans because he writes a million dollars a year. Um, but he likes the business. So that's the best way. Go in, Work, work as a salesman for the business, learn the business from the inside out, build up those relationships with the reps and, and work a deal with the owner where you can buy him out over time and he can stay there to help you out for a couple of years and learn the business with you. And then they're more, they are building a foundation of more success than to try to stand up on their own 
because then they're not fighting all the battles. Yeah, you know, at least that, that is actually take, one of the most brilliant ideas I've ever heard. I, take, I mean, over, it, take over someone else's business. Buy the, buy, buying the business, you're buying the name, you're buying the reputation. Yes, you have to have your own set of financials when you go to refi and, and work with the banks and stuff like that. Yeah, but I mean, you are so right. Well, one of the things about these is there's a whole generation of people, and that's how I got my store. I bought the assets. I didn't even have to buy the store, but there's this whole generation that they don't have anything. They don't have a website. They don't have a database. They have the store. They've been the ones selling. So this would be huge for them to mm -hmm. get out of the business um you'd have to negotiate a good deal because their business is not worth what they think it is no. but it would be a great way for somebody young or mid age starting out someone's as tired of the, the corporate business. world yeah I, I mean, that, money. that was that is brilliant i'm going to do videos and stuff about that one because that was that was huge because a lot of these elderly stores have nobody, no family, no one to turn their store over to. Wow. And yet the owner loves the business. That's why he's done it for 30. I talk years. to them all the time. They yeah. call me all the time. I want to know what they should do, uh, how they should sell the store. And, you know, the store's not worth anything. It's worth zero. Even if I sold my store, thank God I am. I'm, uh, it's better than, you know, floor traders better than Big Dean's Carpet Emporium, you know. Yeah. Who's going to buy that? But someone can buy a store because they run another three other floor trader stores. And it doesn't even have to be in the same location. It could be across the country. Yeah. They're all run the same way, kind of. Um, it, it allows the owner to take his time to retire. A lot of the owners know they're going to die when they retire. That's been their whole life. So, so what? So what if Bob comes in three hours a day, you know, talks to the reps with you and handshakes yeah. and glad shakes the chamber of commerce guy when he comes in exactly you know you drain his brain and as an installer installers installers know how to install but they don't know how to, and they might be great people person but they don't know the business side of things and, and the complaint side of things and all this other stuff yeah um, and some you know they would their eyes would spin open if they learned like complaints and what satisfies the customer what doesn't and all that all the stuff that comes along with it even how to advertise nowadays i'm i'm having to scramble learning what the best me best method of advertising is because yeah. it's gotten so diverse and so liquidated it's crazy well, that was absolutely brilliant i love that idea so i am going to run with that and probably do a whole nother episode just about that um and videos and all sorts of things <laughs> so. yeah, let me know i can more than happy to help you out it's just boy that's just i'm looking for for new people myself i'm looking for um another full-time floor sales guy i'm looking for back back end sales people and, yeah. and ideally the perfect person i'd love to hire is one that that guy that wants to get off his knees that's really good with people you got to be a good people person or else you're screwed you know <clears throat> it's not like you want the guy that, that is an independent installer that's not dependent on the store to give him a job. That, we, that, work, that gets tons of work by referral. That's the kind of guy you want. We had an installer, Dean, that uh, um, had this look on his face like he just didn't give a shit. And he wasn't a bad guy at all. I mean, he was a good installer. But his look on his face just told customers he didn't give a rat's ass about what they thought. And that wasn't the case. That was just his look. Well, right. I'll tell you one thing that really helped him, COVID, when he had to start wearing masks, customers loved this dude. <laughs> when they couldn't see his, his facial expressions, they just, they loved him. So he turned out to be one of our best guys. People raved about him, wrote great reviews. It was such a turnaround. You're now he's not right. wearing the mask anymore. So <laughs> we might want yeah. him to keep wearing it. <laughs> so. Before the installers get off their knees, they need to win, read the book, uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People. <laughs> because there's, you know, there's a whole personal side of, of that. I love working with them because they're technicians and it's very common that technicians start the business. I don't care if it's plumber, electrician, it's always the guys that know how to do the work to start the business, but they don't really know about marketing and sales. They don't know how to hire people. They don't, they don't really know about running a business. They know about, you know, how to do the work. Right. And they could be the best at doing the work, but that's not going to bring customers in the door. 
you know, that's not going to help you sell against a good salesperson. You know, so um, I love teaching that. Also, they have a hard time with the uh, what things cost because they, they were charging a wholesale price and now they got to look at what they were charging and double that so they can get a retail for it. And they got to trust somebody else to do something that they're better at doing themselves. Right. It's really hard for these guys. So I love working with them because I understand a lot of what they're going through and, and trying to get them past all that stuff. Mm -hmm. A lot of the, a lot of the very successful store owners that try to expand their, their three or four store chain, look, getting back to the mom and pop stores, look for the smaller stores where mom and pops needs to retire so they can go in, run it, reface it into their own store again. And they didn't lose a step of business. That's, that's the thing to go after. Yeah. I think you're right to do a whole series on that. All right, Dean, I'm going to wrap this up. Thank you very much for doing the podcast and being on my show. And we'll get together for sure on uh, other things. I, cause I do want to work with you on some other things, but uh, yeah, I'd love to have you out and show you our op operations. So you yeah, I want to come out there. Do what we do different. I do. How cold is it right now? Not bad in the fifties, but rain. Summertime's oh, better. I mean, it's 80 degrees here right now, so it's not bad. <laughs> Actually, it's summertime. It's really nice for three months. We just don't tell anybody because we don't want the Californians to move up. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> or we're having that problem now. It's not because of the weather. <laughs> They're moving away from the crazy that government. Politics. <laughs> so, all right, guys. Uh, well, thanks for joining the Flooring Business Podcast. And remember, if you're already in sales training, just or if you want, are interested in sales training, just send me a message and we'll get you signed up. And if you really want to grow your business fast, check out the Flooring Business Accelerator program. It's a six month program where I work directly with you to grow your business and profits fast. You can contact me at jerry at profitnowatjerry.com for more information. And you guys have a great profitable week.